Carbon-14 is produced in the atmosphere by the sun. It breaks down at the rate of about half of it will break down every 5,730 years. This is called the half-life. So if I gave you a pile of carbon-14 and you waited 5,730 years, half of it would turn back to nitrogen and you'd end up with half a pile. If you wait another 5,700 years, half of that is going to turn to nitrogen. You end up with a fourth of a pile. In theory, it never goes to zero. It goes from half to fourth to eighth to sixteenth, etc. But plants are always breathing in carbon-14 in the photosynthesis process. They're breathing in carbon. Some of it's carbon-14. Most of it's normal carbon-12. Animals eat the plants and make it part of their body. Probably during your lifetime, you've either eaten plants or you've eaten animals that have eaten plants. That's about all there is to eat out there. And so you're absorbing radioactive carbon into you, just like I am into me, because we're getting it through the food chain. The plants got it from the air. The air got it from the sun. This carbon-14 got into the plants. Then it got into you or into the animals and then into you. But either way, we all contain some radioactive carbon. When the plant or animal dies, it's not going to get any more, obviously. So several assumptions are involved in carbon dating. First of all, they assume that the amount of C14 in the atmosphere, the ratio, which is a very small number, is the same found in the plants and animals. For instance, the atmosphere contains 0.0000765% radioactive carbon-14. It is assumed that I have the same. I've never been tested for C14, and I've never met anybody who has. But I would say that's a reasonable assumption, but it is an assumption. Okay. When the plant or animal dies, it doesn't get any more C14, so whatever it had begins to decay. It was decaying while it was alive, but you never noticed it because it's being replenished, so the balance would stay. But as soon as it dies, it begins to go out of balance. So basically, carbon dating is measuring the amount of carbon in the object with the amount of carbon in the atmosphere and getting a balance. If the atmosphere is 0.0000765% and the object you're dating is only half as much, they would assume it's been dead for one half-life. If it's only one-fourth as much, it's been dead for two half-lives, two times 5,730. And then it goes to a fourth, to an eighth, to a sixteenth. So they're comparing the amount in the object with the amount in the atmosphere. This is how carbon dating works. Sounds good, certainly sounds scientific, but it's based on some serious assumptions that mess up everything. It doesn't work. If I told you to fill a barrel with water, but I have drilled holes in the barrel, while you're putting water in, it begins to leak out. So you have a process of filling and a process of leaking at the same time. You have an adding and subtracting going on simultaneously. At some point, you're going to reach a stage called equilibrium. You'll never fill the barrel past that point unless you speed up the input or decrease the outgo one or the other. Well, Earth's atmosphere is constantly taking in carbon-14 from the sun and is constantly losing it to decay. So you have the same thing as the barrel. The question would be, how long would it take the Earth's atmosphere to reach equilibrium? Well, when carbon dating was first discovered or invented in the early 1950s or late 1940s, actually, Willard Libby did this, University of Chicago, he said, you know, I wonder how long it would take the Earth's atmosphere to reach equilibrium, because he knew about the equilibrium problem. They said, after doing some studies, it would take about 30,000 years. Basically, if you made a brand new planet Earth, poof, create one, cover it with air, start it spinning around itself and spinning around the sun, the sun is going to strike the oxygen, strike the atmosphere and produce carbon-14, and it's going to start decaying. And they said within 30,000 years, the atmosphere would be equalized. You'd reach this point called equilibrium. You're never going to get more C14, and you shouldn't get any less unless something changes in the system. Well, sounds good. I don't know if the number's right, but it's a, the concept is. Within 30,000 years, the Earth's atmosphere would reach equilibrium. The problem is, we still haven't reached equilibrium. There's more C14 now than there was 20 years ago. Actually, radiocarbon is forming 28 to 37 percent faster than its decay. So if we still haven't reached equilibrium, then the Earth is less than 30,000 years old, which is what the Christians have been saying all along. Uh, a friend of mine has a website, archie.org. You can get information there about uh, the Earth's atmosphere has still not reached equilibrium. There have been a lot of people doing research on this, and it just we're, we're not there yet. This chart indicates how carbon-14 is supposed to work in theory. An, an object that is still alive should be in balance with the atmosphere, which would give you 16, I'm going to simplify this a little bit, give you 16 clicks per minute per gram on your Geiger counter. If you're listening to, a, you know, dating, a, testing a sample, it'll go click every four seconds, you know, click, click. If it's only giving you eight clicks per minute, 
then you're getting, you're assuming it's 5,700 years old. It's been through one half life. If you're only getting four clicks per minute, it's been through two half lives. If you're getting two clicks per minute, it's been through three half lives. It's 11,000 years old. This is how carbon dating is done. If you test a sample and you find out you're getting, you know, two and a half clicks per minute or 2.9 or something like that, you look at the chart and read over and find the age by the simple calibration curve, they call it. Sounds good. Doesn't work. If you walked into a room and found a candle burning on a table, and I asked you the very simple question, when was it lit? You say, oh, I don't know, it was burning when I got here. Okay, let's do what's called empirical science, things we can test and demonstrate and weigh and prove, okay? We're going to measure the candle. We measure the height of the candle. We find out the candle is seven inches tall. Okay, when was it lit? You say, oh, I don't know. Okay, let's do some more science. Let's measure how fast it burns. Suppose we get an Olympic stopwatch and we measure this thing very carefully and find out the candle is burning one inch every hour. Now we've got two hard science empirical facts. The candle is seven inches tall. It is burning an inch an hour. When was it lit? You still can't tell me unless you make some assumptions. How tall was it? And has it always burned at the same rate? Neither of those assumptions can be proven. They are purely assumptions, okay? If you find a fossil in the dirt, all you know is it died. You don't even know where it died. You just know where it ended up buried, that's all. Now, the amount of carbon-14 could be measured very precisely, and the rate of, de of decay could be determined. But when did it live? I have no idea, and nobody does, because you'd have to know how much was in it when it was alive, which that would depend on the assumption that the Earth's atmosphere has reached equilibrium, and we haven't. And you'd have to know that it's always decayed at the same rate. Now, if the Bible is right, and the earth had a canopy of water overhead, like the Bible, I think, clearly teaches in 2 Peter 3 and in Genesis 1, 6, and 7, this canopy of water would filter out quite a bit of radiation, and they probably had a lot less carbon-14 in the original creation than we do today. So, if you dig up a fossil from an animal that drowned in the flood, and I don't know if any of these are or not, but if you find a fossil and say, well, I believe this one, this ammonite may have drowned in the flood. Probably did. And we want to find, and find out it's got carbon. It probably doesn't. It's been totally replaced by minerals. But let's assume it, 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 it has organic material. And so we carbon date it. They would assume that it lived in an atmosphere that's just like we have today. Meh, faulty assumption. Not a good idea. Here's some examples of how carbon dating doesn't work. We'll go in chronological order here. Back in 1949, an article came out in Natural History magazine it said the lower leg of a mammoth dated 15,000 years old, but the skin dated 21,000 years old. It didn't work in 1949. 1963, a living mollusk shell carbon dated at 2,300 years old. Well, here we are 14 years later, carbon dating is still not working. Okay. Uh, 1970, this article came out and they said, if a carbon date supports our theories, we put it in the main text. If it is not entirely contradicting, we put it in a footnote. If it's completely out of date, we just drop it. 1971, a freshly killed seal carbon dated at 1,300 years old. Still not working, folks. Okay. 1975, a baby mammoth was found frozen. Part of it dated 40,000 years old. Another part was 26,000 years old, and the wood next to it is 9,000 years old. Still not working in 1975. 1981, they tried it again. This guy said, no matter how useful it is, the radiocarbon method is still not capable of yielding accurate and reliable results. There are gross discrepancies. The chronology is uneven and relative, and the accepted dates are actually selected dates. This whole blessed thing is nothing but 13th century alchemy. It all depends upon which funny paper you read. Still not working. 1984, shells from living snails were carbon dated at 27,000 years old. Still not working. 1985, they took 11 human skeletons, the earliest known human remains in the Western Hemisphere, and they were carbon dated, or dated by accelerator mass spectrometer, all 11 dated 5,000 radiocarbon years or less. Here, these things are supposed to be, you know, a quarter million years old or something. It's not working in 1985. 1992, two Colorado Creek mammoths, side by side, buried frozen mammoths, were dated. One was 22,000 years old, the other is 16,000 years old. Still not working in 92. In 1996, at uh, Berkeley University, they've got the Geochronology Center. Carl Swisher used the most advanced techniques to date human fossils. 
This article said last spring he was reevaluating Homo erectus skulls found in Java by testing the sediment found with them. A hominid species assumed to be an ancestor of Homo sapien, erectus was thought to have vanished a quarter million years ago. Even though he used two different dating methods, Swisher kept making the same startling find. The bones were 53,000 at most and possibly no more than 27,000. Well, I would like to point out, Your Honor, that is a 96% error. So it's not working in 1996 either.